I was at a scientific conference when I received an urgent phone call from my university's press office. They told me to stop whatever I was doing and turn on the TV right now to a show called Fox and Friends. There, a newscaster was talking about what scientists should be working on. AIDS, cancer, the Zika virus. They said, if these areas had received more funding, then we might even have a cure for them by now. Then she took out a large game show wheel with the names of scientific studies on each of the panels. She was joined by a senator, and together, the two of them spun the wheel. <laughs> Wherever it landed, they began a harsh inquisition, a criticism of why this work was a waste of taxpayer money. The senator also released what looks like a children's coloring book, <laughs> highlighting 20 of the nation's most wasteful studies for the year 2016. I'll read you a few of them. Yeah, I heard, oh my god, that's what I said. How many shakes does it take for a wet dog to dry off? Which has more hairs, a squirrel or honeybee? How long does it take to pee like a racehorse? <laughs> Although there were a number of people accused, those three studies I just read were all done by a single person. That is, one person is responsible for 15% of the nation's most wasteful science. My name is David Hu. <laughs> and I am the country's most wasteful scientist. <laughs> I'm here to show you that what sounds like a waste can be utterly fascinating. And the whole idea of waste completely misses the purpose of science. So, how did I start studying mammal urination? <laughs> A few years ago, um, I was very, very depressed. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is because we had um, two small children in the house and I was changing diapers every two hours, about 12 times a day. I was exhausted. And, um, but kids, they really like it when you change their diapers. They enjoy the moments of interaction, and they play games with you. And one of their favorite games to play is, hey, let's wait till the diaper's off, and then let's pee. <laughs> so there's, I remember it was the middle of the afternoon, I was just exhausted, I hadn't slept. I put my son on the changing table. Son Harry, he's sitting right here. <laughs> and uh, I this is tired, very tired. I took off his diaper, and then I felt it hit me. <laughs> Urine, right in the middle of my chest. And I was so shocked because I thought father should be about gratitude. <laughs> Fatherhood, we should be getting things. And when my wife tells me when I'm getting angry, what I should do is I should start counting. So I did. One, two, three, and I counted for a long time. I counted all the way up to 21 seconds. And I thought, that's a really long time for a kid's urine. <laughs> it's a little bit too long. I started growing concerned. I put the diaper back on. I was soaked. I thought, <laughs> oh, am I going to have to go back to the pediatrician's office? Oh, waiting in those lines again. What if my son has some kind of blockage, some kind of something in his bladder that's preventing him from peeing? Oh, I started thinking about it. I had no answer to this question. So I went to the bathroom, and I pulled down my pants. <laughs> and I started doing my own experiments. <laughs> and I started counting. One, two, three. And I counted all the way up to 22 seconds. <laughs> and I thought, Wow, my son, 
urinates like a real man. I should have called him Hercules. But this didn't make any sense at all because where does urine come from? It's a byproduct of the bladder. It's proportional to how much blood we have. Basically, I have ten, ten times as much blood as my son. I should have ten times as much urine. How in the world are we getting it out in the same time? I, you know, I'm a, I have a PhD in fluid mechanics, but I <laughs> could not answer this question. So the very next day, I went to my um, undergraduate fluid mechanics class and told them the story, the same story I'm telling you. And they just looked at me shocked. <laughs> they were speechless, and I, I asked them, do I have any volunteers do a special project on urination? <laughs> and absolutely no one raised their hand. <laughs> then I asked, do I have any pre-meds in the audience? And there's one thing I've learned as a pre-med myself, we'll do anything for a grade. <laughs> so I found two pre-meds. I said, come to my office. Come here to my office. <laughs> see this stopwatch and see this bucket? I want you to take these to the Atlanta Zoo and don't come back until you've measured the urination time and volume of every animal at the zoo. And for years, the zoo and I, we've had a good relationship. I send them emails saying I want to measure their animals' private bathroom procedures. They say yes. So they're able to do this. And they come back um, in, in two weeks. And they're also very, very depressed. <laughs> they're... They're completely covered in dust, and they smell terrible. <laughs> and then um, they said, our data is really boring. I, it's not even worth talking about. I said, let me be the judge of that. I just have one question for you. What did the elephant do? <laughs> oh, they said the elephant was the hardest animal to work with. We, couldn't get them to follow directions, so we had to come up at 5 a.m. in the morning when the elephant gets up out of bed. And um, we held up a kitchen garbage can, about this big, this tall, uh, about 20 liters. And um, we waited. And I said, how long does it take? Well, they said, it takes about 22 seconds. And I said, this is the biggest discovery of my career. <laughs> we can publish this. And I asked them about the rest of their data, and it turned out there are basically two kinds of animals in the world. Those less than three kilograms, and they urinate for fractions of a second. Then there are those um, that are above three kilograms, all the way up to an elephant. It's 8,000 kilograms, it has a bladder 100 times that of a dog. But all these animals get their urine out in about 21 seconds. 21 plus or minus 13 seconds. Okay, plus or minus 13. Keep in mind that the elephant has 100 times more urine. A safety factor of 50% isn't that bad. <laughs> the great thing about undergraduate research is that you have to be very, very creative in coming up with these procedures. Have you ever seen the urination of a rat? They come out in small urine gumballs, and I'll show you. <laughs> when, um, when we first wanted to measure the urination of a dog, um, my idea was take a pot and just follow a dog around. <laughs> and so we did this, and the dogs just kept on looking at us, saying, hey, um, I want to have some privacy, please. And it didn't work at all. It was terrible, a terrible idea. So eventually we got smart, and we used um, one of these training pads, and we measured the weight of the pad, assuming it's the density of water, extrapolate the volume of the urine. Cows, they live their lives in these small stalls, very cramped, but they can be trained to urinate upon command if you rub them. And now, I'll show you, for the first time at Emory University, <laughs> the evolution of the urinary system. The rat's bladder, so forces are so small, it can't actually beat the forces of surface tension, pushing the urine back in. So if you're a rat, you actually urinate little urine gumballs. You cannot generate a jet. This is as strong as the flow gets. It's a fraction of a second. These animals don't satisfy our, our mathematical laws. The second animal, this is a goat. This is probably more similar to what you see this morning. <laughs> this is what we call a Rayleigh plateau instability, where jets turn into drops as they slow down. 
when fluid exits out of a sheath, it generates this fluid um, gum, these are uh, uh, basically fluid fish bones, a nice planar pattern. And this is my favorite video of all time because it's Patricia Yang's PhD thesis. Part one and part two. I couldn't be happier. So how do all these urine animals urinate in constant time? We scoured the literature and we found that for the last 50 years, there's been a search for the model organism to study animal urination. And of all those animals, they have one thing in common, and they have a pipe. Um, that I tell my children, uh, it's called, it's the pee pee pipe. And uh, they're always arguing. My son says, I have a pee pee pipe, you don't, to my daughter. And, he, and my daughter says, Daddy! <laughs> and I tell them, stop, kids. Both of you have pee pee pipes. Look at this graph. <laughs> a male, all male animals, from mice to elephants, have a pee pee pipe that has aspect ratio, a length to diameter ratio, about 25 to 1. Females have a pee pee pipe of 17 to 1. It's just inside their body. So all these animals share this pee pee pipe. And until now, no one knew what this pee pee pipe was for. What is the pee pee pipe for? <laughs> Why do we have pee pee pipes? If you want to get an answer, you can ask Georgia Tech students about what they call beer keg physics. <laughs> if you want to drink beer from a keg, you want it to come out fast. And for that, you basically have a, a choice about where to poke the hole. You should poke the hole near the bottom. And that's because the weight of the fluid in the keg actually increases the pressure and pushes fluid out faster at the bottom. And it gets slower and slower as you go up. This beer keg is actually just like the pee pee pipe. The pee pee pipe just arranges fluid in a tall vertical column. An infinitesimal amount of volume arranged vertically can generate very high flow speeds when you consider the animals that I'm going to show you. My pee pee pipe, I looked at it this morning, um, <laughs> actually just a few minutes ago, is about the length of my hand. And the, it's about, <laughs> OK, OK. Okay, <laughs> this, and it's the, di and the urethra, the pee pee pipe's the diameter of a coffee stirrer. The elephant's pee pee pipe is a meter tall and has the diameter of my fist. Imagine the pee pee pipe is like a highway where basically urine molecules each have basically separate lanes to follow. The wider the pee pee pipe, the more lanes there are, the faster urine can go through. Moreover, because of the height and because of the beer keg physics, each of those urine molecules in the elephant is traveling at a faster speed. So you get more cars and they're all going faster. In mathematical terms, the kinetic energy of the, of the urine is equal to gravitational potential energy plus the bladder pressure. The time to urinate is given by the volume of the bladder, which can be measured, divided by the area of the cross-section times the velocity of each particle, it allows us to write what we call the law of urination, <laughs> which basically tells us that animals urinate for about the same time. Some of you maybe, maybe don't believe me, and for that you can do your own experiments at home. <laughs> this is actually just um, yellow water. We put pee pee pipes of the appropriate uh, length of a rhino, a human, and a dog. And even though it's almost a factor of uh, 10 in volume, they can all empty at the same time. This is the power of the pee pee pipe. <laughs> There's a coffee break in about 15 minutes. And um, some of you can try your own experiments. It's my dream that this research will actually appear in a children's book and allow children to measure their own times. And if you measure it, um, later today, and you, you can send it to me a text to Dr. David Hu on Twitter, you'll find that it's about 21 seconds. We were on a show called Science Friday, and Fahad wrote in saying, I'm sorry this came to me as a shock because my average urination time is 60 seconds. <laughs> That's his average. <laughs> and my longest time ever was 150 seconds, almost three minutes. 
I thought this was common for a lot of people if they just drink a lot of liquid until I saw this video. Hey, can someone tell me if they have a similar experience? If I need to see a doctor? <laughs> SUNY Medical School wrote, you need a prostate exam. <laughs> In fact, as you get older, the prostate expands and shrinks the PP pipe down to the diameter of that of a mouse, decreasing the uh, urination flow rate. Not just um, news stations were interested in our work, but scientists too began to take notice. All the way from Netherlands to Japan, our work has been cited almost 20 times since it was published. In Japan, um, a doctor was inspired by our study. He knew that when you go to a doctor with bladder problems, um, what is required is expensive tests involving lasers and equipment. He thought a simpler and more cheaper way would be to measure urination time, and he interviewed 2017 Japanese people about their urination times, finding that their urination time increased from uh, 21 seconds at age 30 all the way up to 31 seconds at age 80. One day, to measure the health of your bladder, your doctor might ask you, how long did you urinate today? Incontinence is an increasing problem, especially for the elderly. One solution is to apply uh, this prosthesis, an electronic device that provides electrical signals to your bladder to better control urination. The device is tested in cats, and what's needed is a healthy baseline for when um, your bladder's uh, working properly. The healthy baseline chosen by engineers is our 21 second rule. The generation of organs is an important new area, and regenerating urethras are, are no, is no exception. Uh, this, is actually, um, this is actually a um, urethra made from human cells and a collagen scaffolding, and it has to be tested for durability. Uh, to do so, they test it for three days, simulating real human conditions. That involves, um, that involves 21 seconds of urination every uh, two hours. All these studies I read to you were all published in the year 2017 alone. They show that our 21 second rule for urination can have a critical input into uh, developing new treatments, prostheses, and implants, work that directly helps people. I started this talk about research that, is, that seems like a waste. The idea of waste is based on the notions of a limited gas tank and a known destination. People would like science to save gas as we travel from A to B. But the real power, the real power of science is to take us to destinations that we've never been. Like the discovery that measuring urination time can be a marker of bladder health. One day, when you're 80 and you feel your urination time slowing down a little bit, uh, you might take a drug that this research once contributed to. With that, thanks for being a great audience. Thank you.